Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We've got another cheap laptop from China to take a look at. It's the Jumper EasyBook X4 that just came out. This is a $300 laptop, fanless, powered by a Gemini Lake N4100 processor. We're going to be putting it through its paces here in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this came in free of charge through GearBest.com. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, and no one has reviewed what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop can and cannot do. Now, I want to begin by reminding everybody that this is a buy-at-your-own-risk proposition. Uh, Jumper is a company that cranks out a lot of cheap computers, and they often replace their models every three or four months with something new, and there's really no long-term support to speak of. So three months out, if it dies, it's going to remain dead. Uh, there's really not an easy way to get help from the company. So just keep that in mind as we are going through the review here. I don't want anyone to go in with the wrong expectations. Now, as I mentioned, this is powered by an Intel N4100 processor. This is the new low-end chip from Intel, the Gemini Lake series, quad core. It's got four gigabytes of RAM built in. Uh, the RAM though is not upgradable. I think the GearBest listing at the time I'm recording this indicates that it is upgradable. It is not, it is soldered onto the motherboard. Uh, we took apart the laptop on my extras channel. I'll run some B-roll here so you can see what it looks like and you can get a closer view on it uh, in that video, which I'll link to down below in the video description. For storage though, it does have a 120 gigabyte M2 SSD drive built in, which is good because those are usually faster than uh, some of the cheap eMMC storage that usually gets put into these devices. And you can upgrade the storage very easily. There's a little uh, panel here that you pop off and the drive is right underneath that. You can put in one of the shorter M2 drives or the longer ones. So you do have some degree of upgradability on the storage, just not on the RAM. Display is a 14-inch 1080p display, which is great, but it is a TN display, meaning it's not going to be as sharp and crisp as what you might see on your tablet devices or your phones or other more expensive ultrabooks. You'll see the image kind of die off as you uh, go off angle on it. Uh, it's not bad, though, when you're looking dead on. Uh, pretty crisp for what it is, but uh, again, not an IPS display, so you may uh, not like that if you're used to those crisper displays on more expensive devices. Now, the laptop weighs about 2.9 pounds or 1.3 kilograms, not all that heavy for a 14-inch device. It's actually pretty well put together also. All metal, uh, it's got a nice solid feel to it. The hinge is a little wobbly, as you can see here, but it generally keeps the display where you want it to be. Uh, you don't have a lot of uh, range on the display here, but uh, it does stay put, which is good. Uh, one thing that is not so good, though, is the version of Windows they installed on it. So this has the Chinese version of Windows that they installed the English language pack on. And in order to get that language pack installed, they have to set it up with an admin account already configured. And as a result, uh, there is no password to get into this machine when you first get it. Uh, so a lot of people might just get it and just start using it, and you've got a completely unprotected PC. But my bigger concern is what might have made its way onto this laptop in the factory when they were uh, getting this version of Windows prepared for this particular computer. So one thing you might want to consider doing uh, is backing up the drivers. There's a great free utility out there called Double Driver, and then reinstall Windows from scratch. You'll have to install the Chinese version of Windows to re retain the activation and then activate that language pack yourself, but I'm always nervous when these things come to me already configured, so just keep that in mind as you are making your buying decisions. For ports, we don't have too much on this one. We've got a micro HDMI out. We have a USB 3.0 port on this side. On the other side of the laptop, we've got a micro SD card reader. You can put your cards flush to the side of the device there, so you can augment its storage if you wish. You have another USB 3.0 port here, and they had to put this ugly sticker on here to make sure that you don't plug the power port into the headphone jack, which is right next to the power port. I hate when they do this, but they have a sticker here for you so that you don't blow yourself up in the process. So uh, that was, uh, I guess it was okay to see that. The keyboard isn't bad for a cheap laptop. Um, it is backlit. It's got two levels of backlighting that you can see here. And the only issue I've got with the keyboard is that sometimes when you're looking at it without the backlight on, you can't see the keys because they kind of blend in uh, with the silver of the keyboard. It might be hard to see here, but you can see as I go slightly off angle there, the key uh, caps kind of disappear. And the trackpad looks nicer than it is on this. So it kind of looks like an Apple trackpad. It's got that same look to it, but the feel is not the same. 
Uh, so it requires a lot of force to click down. Uh, it's pretty noisy as you can hear, and it's not a smart trackpad, so you can't do a two finger click, for example, to get a right click. You have to click on the right side of the uh, trackpad here to get that click to initiate. Uh, so there are two clickers, one on this side and one on that side, and if you happen to click in the middle, you kind of get a mix of the two. So you want to be careful uh, where you place your fingers when you're doing your clicking, and you've got to be kind of down in the lower left-hand corner to get your left click going. So always little compromises made on these cheap devices, and uh, that is one that was made there. Battery life, we're looking at about five to six hours, give or take. Uh, if you turn down the display brightness and stick to some pretty low-end tasks, I think you might be able to squeeze a little bit more life out of of it, but uh, not the greatest battery life on this one. Uh, it does have 802.11n Wi-Fi, so it can connect up to 5 gigahertz networks, but it does not have uh, AC wireless built in. And it supports Bluetooth, so keyboards, mice, audio devices, all of that kind of stuff should work on it too. The speakers are right under the display hinge here. They don't sound great at all, so you might want to get one of those audio devices plugged into it. So that's the overall hardware, not bad. Let's take a look now and see how it performs. So let's kick things off with some web browsing. We've got my YouTube channel running with one of my 1080p 60 videos. We had a couple of drop frames when it started, but it was able to play those back just fine. Uh, so no issues there. I think you'll have uh, very good experiences with Netflix and other streaming video providers. Web browsing was also pretty snappy on it and responsive for what we uh, would expect out of one of these chips. And I remain impressed by how uh, Intel has really every year been making dramatic improvements in just perceivable performance on uh, these low-end chips. And this Gemini Lake generation is no exception there. So that was good to see. And on the browserbench.org spinometer test, we got a score of 58.4. Uh, which does a little better than last year's Apollo Lake generation of processors. And I also found it was scoring better on that test uh, versus the Lenovo Flex 6 we looked at just two weeks ago uh, that's powered by a similar Gemini Lake processor. So it might be that uh, Jumper is allowing this chip to run a little faster perhaps on this device than Lenovo was on theirs. Fanless computers are often uh, very tricky to get right because you don't want the processor to get too hot. And as a result, many manufacturers tweak these chips to uh, run at different speeds to keep the thermals down. So we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And we also ran our Microsoft Word test with the newsletter template that we like to use in these videos. And everything seemed to be working just fine there. Pretty snappy performance like we've seen on other Gemini Lake generation processors. And I think you'll have uh, very good experiences doing your Microsoft Word Word, Excel, and other Office applications. So let's shift gears to gaming. We've got Minecraft running here, getting about 17 to 25 frames per second with the Optifine Performance Enhancer installed at 1080p. So you'll probably have to tweak your graphics settings a bit on Minecraft to get it working properly. We also checked out Rocket League, and uh, there we had to turn the settings down to 720p. And we were only getting about 17 to 20 frames per second there, so not so great for Rocket League. Uh, we were able to see that running uh, fairly decently on some of the new Intel desktop NUCs powered with the same generation of processor, but this machine just could not keep up with that. But old stuff seems to work pretty nicely. Half-Life 2 is running at close to 60 frames per second at 720p on low settings. And then we were able to get about 30 frames per second out of Half-Life 2 at 1080p. So if you've got a bunch of older games from like 10 or 15 years ago in your Steam library, uh, those should work pretty nicely on here. These are also good for emulation, so running the main arcade emulator or some of the 32-bit and back emulators for game consoles should also do okay on this, but don't expect a AAA or modern uh, gaming experience on one of these cheap fanless devices. And on the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 2,314 which puts it pretty much in line with what we saw with the Lenovo Flex 6 powered by a similar Gemini Lake processor. So I think this performance is about what we can expect from other Gemini Lake powered laptops that we will likely be getting in over the next couple of months. So I think this is pretty much where it's going to be. So not a huge improvement in gaming, but a slight one over last year's Apollo Lake chipset. Now, with this being a fanless device, the temperature is very important to monitor on this. And we ran uh, the 3D Mark stress test, which runs a benchmark test over and over again to see how hot the computer gets and whether or not the computer slows itself down to keep itself from getting too hot. And there we got a score of 96%, which is just short of a passing grade 
but not bad for a fanless laptop. So the processor got up to about 76 degrees Celsius or 169 degrees Fahrenheit, and it didn't appear that it was throttling all that much when it was under that extreme load. And we popped open Cody and ran the Jellyfish benchmark video that we like to run, 140 megabits per second, HEVC at 10 bit, a 4K file and it was able to keep up with that just fine. We had some drop frames when we first ran it, but the second run, uh, everything was running uh, as we would expect it to. Intel has made tremendous strides in video decoding performance on these low-end chips, and it continues here with the Gemini Lake generation, so that was nice to see. And we also booted up Ubuntu on the laptop and were able to get most of its components working. So video, audio, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of those things were recognized, but the trackpad was our biggest issue. It recognized the mouse pointer moving around, but it did not recognize any clicks on the trackpad. So you might have to hunt around uh, for the right trackpad driver here to make this thing work. So just bear that in mind. It might be a great Linux device if you can figure out the trackpad component. We had to plug in an external mouse to get it all working. So overall, not a bad computer for the price point. Again, I just want to caution you on some issues you might encounter should you ever have a problem with it. You probably will not get any kind of long-term support out of this. We did have one little glitch on the keyboard where the keyboard effectively stopped working until we rebooted the computer. So uh, that was something that happened in the course of our testing. It did not happen again, but these kinds of glitches tends, tend to happen on these little uh, cheap machines here. And there's also a dead pixel here that uh, we noticed when we first took it out of the box. But beyond that, it seems like a uh, fairly well put together computer for the price point. Just know what you're getting into before you buy. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including gold level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.